Allison Fitzgerald, and I go by the pronouns she and her. I'm a student of the Advanced Studio Practice Program at New Brunswick College of Craft and Design in the Jewelry uh, Studio. Today's our 12th lecture, and it's going to be great to have Peter Thomas as our guest speaker today. Heads up that the session is being recorded, so by staying and participating, you are consenting to being recorded. A gentle reminder that you can be seen and heard. So please, if you haven't done so already, turn off your microphones uh, or turn your microphones to mute to avoid feedback. And if you're experiencing glitching, turning off the video can help. The opinions given are strictly those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect those of NBCCD, the ACC, or the Sheila Humakai Foundation. Lastly, I ask for your patience and understanding with the technology as we all navigate this delivery mode and change of pace. To officially begin, we are going to go over to Joe for the territorial and acknowledgement. This land that we stand on, upon is unceded and unsurrendered territory where we live and work. Between, between 1725 and 1779, the peace and friendship treaties were signed between the El Nu, the Wolastic Wewick, the Passamaquoddy First Nations, and the British. These treaties were among the earliest to be made between Indigenous nations and Western nations. Since Confederation, the Canadian government has made efforts to assimilate and erase Indigenous peoples through vile policies, which include the Indian Act and the Residential Schools Act. But despite these efforts, the resilience of Indigenous peoples has continued to influence Canada's social, cultural, political, and environmental perspective to this day. Thank you, Joe. Now we're gonna go over to Audrey to tell us about the guest lecture series. This guest lecture series is sponsored and made possible by the Shula Hugh Mackay Foundation. It is organized by the Advanced Studio Practice Program at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design in partnership with the Atlantic Center for Creativity. The purpose of the guest lecture series is to model successful contemporary practice to our students and to inform, inspire, and ignite art and design dialogue and engagement in the greater public community. The guest lecture series provides this by giving a platform for presentation, creating time for dialogue, and by <coughs> celebrating the creative and cultural riches that we hold in Atlantic Canada. Thank you, Audrey. <clears throat> Over to Ben to tell us about our partner, the ACC. The Atlantic Center for Creativity is an initiative that promotes creativity across disciplines. It has three main goals. One, to promote research and programming in the area of creativity and innovation. Two, to offer events such as symposia, conferences, and workshops on a yearly basis for sharing ideas and information. And three, to build partnerships in the area of creativity and innovation on a local, regional, and national basis. You can get additional information and check out the new online journal, Creativity Matters, by visiting the website, AtlanticCenterForCreativity.com. Thank you, Ben. Now we're gonna go back to Jean for the guest speaker introduction. You're muted, Jean. Okay, that's better. Thanks for that, Allison. <laughs> Uh, so today we have Peter Thomas with us, and I feel like we've caught a big fish. I've been wanting to kind of interview Peter and talk to him. So today's format is going to be kind of like a dialogue, a back and forth, and a kind of uh, guided questions. And we've described it as a rhizomatic journey through stories and reflection. So in this informal discussion, guided by questions, Peter will share stories and considerations on the creative life. Peter Thomas is internationally known as both an artist and a teacher. He's exhibited in exhibitions in Canada, the United States, Scotland and England. Peter obtained his first degree at the Edinburgh College of Art in Scotland, where he, became, where he later completed a postgraduate fellowship. He received a Master's of Fine Art in Ceramics and Printmaking in 1967 from the prestigious Claremont Graduate School, that is a university dedicated to graduate research in California. Peter was studio head of ceramics and is now still with us instructing fine craft ceramics at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design. So you're very welcome, Peter. 
before Jean goes any further, I want a little <laughs> qualification here. I warned her this could be a train wreck. <laughs> and I warned her it could be a train wreck because Jean and I come from a tradition of, it's a sort of European tradition, but particularly a Irish, Scottish, British one of, I, I guess I could best describe it as pub discourse. The basis yeah. of it is you let somebody start talking. The moment they come up with an interesting <laughs> idea, you interrupt them and you talk over them till they talk over you. The other thing you do, and I'm saying this now because we already got caught out doing it. Yeah, every time. You take, position, you take positions you don't necessarily believe in just in order to get the person irritated enough to try and come <laughs> up with some really interesting ideas that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of. To a North American, this sounds like a pitched argument which can likely be completed only by gunfire. <laughs> the European, it just means another pint of beer, but you know, so fair warning before we get started. <laughs> uh, it's true. And you know, I've, I, I often, when I hit problems in work or I want some good company and conversation and not just like, you know, shallow stuff. When I want to have really good discussions about craft or art, I will often gravitate towards Peter Thomas and go find him in the building when I want to get stuck in and have a good old discussion or even an argument. So I think that um, I promise to be nice. Peter might not make that same promise, <laughs> but we have some wonderful, wonderful stories and, and reflections to share, I think. So maybe as a way, Peter, to dive in, to kind of consider and I'm, I'm kind of thinking of one of your prompts that you've shared with me, um, reflections, when we say, why art at all? So I'm hoping you could maybe talk a bit about uh, your personal journey into discovering the creative life or, or, or wh where you had those personal epiphanies that led you uh, to being uh, within the, the creative sector. <laughs> I, I had no intention of being an artist. That was the last thing in my mind. And I was, um, <clears throat> I was brought up in a way which wasn't uncommon for a lot of people in the British sort of Raj. My parents worked abroad as civil servants in different countries of the Commonwealth. I was sent to boarding schools in Ireland and in Scotland. Uh, I intended, I had a father who was a Fabian socialist, that's sort of the intellectual side of the Labour Party in Britain, the, the, um, <laughs> the Communist Party to the States. Um, but, and he was also a founding member of what was then the CCF, uh, which is now the um, NDP, and when, it, when he moved to Canada. And really the sort of feeling in my family was you should go out and do useful things for people in the world and in my particular family was and that should particularly be for people in whatever you defined as the developing world which was more often not places which were had been and continued to be continually more sophisticated than Britain was. So when I went to public school I was an outsider I'd been brought up sort of in countries abroad and I found myself in one of these stuffy places in Britain, which is designed for the, to train the leading people of Britain who will presumably go out and then control the Commonwealth. And that was still being considered in the 60s, long after mm. Britain was losing the Commonwealth. So I did gravitate to the art room, just simply because the art room was the one place where one could just be oneself. There was a wonderful art teacher, a guy called Teddy Gage, who just promoted discussion and talk and argument. And inadvertently, I found I was quite good at putting paint and paper and playing around, make, designing theater sets and stuff like that. But I mean, this was, this was a whimsy. It was a hobby. Mm. And, you know, quite, quite honestly, I rather suspected art was a self-indulgent self act for an individual and had nothing really to do with the public at all. But did you feel, Peter, though, that was the one place that you could be yourself? even though you, you had reservations maybe about it being self-indulgent. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, because we could talk about anything and there was nobody there who was pretending to be, a, you know, a, a upcoming leader of the British Empire. In fact, half of us in there, our parents lived abroad, you know, so it was, it was the hidey hole of the department. Then I went out and played rugby and thugged up on all the other people, so I felt kind of okay about it. Um, probably would never have gone into art. I was training to be a doctor and 
when I was 17, I was out in West Africa with my parents and my mother and her infinite ability to do the wrong thing from her point of view decided I had to be introduced to the art teacher at the international school she was teaching at. The art teacher was, I was teasing Jean, I always get into trouble with redheads and I <laughs> rarely do the right thing. Um, the art teacher was this tough little redheaded woman from London, a Cockney, who really didn't approve at all of any kind of young men who went to British public schools. And so when, when we were introduced, she sort of looked, looked up her nose at me and basically said, oh, hi, and walked away, um, <laughs> leaving me feeling a little bit snubbed and somewhat out of joint. But a while later, we met again, and she looked at me and said, your mother, and I'm not going to imitate her Cockney accent, says, your, your mom says you, you like art. And I said, yes. So what are you going to do with your life? And I said, well, I'm probably going to be a doctor. Why? <laughs> I said, because... I can do good things for people and that's a really noble way to spend one's life and she said well why wouldn't you do art and I said because I'd just be basically doing that myself and she said well what are you best at mm. <laughs> I had to admit that and then when I sort of havered she said where do you best like being and I said oh, well okay all right in the art room she said in that case I won't mention the word she used because we're on air um, you know Go and do the damn thing you can do best. The thing you do best is the best thing you can do other people. <laughs> and that yeah. was the end of the conversation temporarily. We then became actually quite good friends for all of about two weeks. And then mother decided she was, I was being seduced, which was utterly <laughs> untrue. But mother was a Methodist missionary and that was the end of that friendship. But yeah. I went into art. <laughs> yeah. But so the seed had been planted. So you've had these like teachers who encouraged you along the way, this teacher in Ghana and also a, a teacher in school who were noting and kind of uh, kind of planted the seed or the thought there. And so you went to art college and initially you went in to become a painter, is that right? Oh, to become a world famous painter. I, they, there was no yeah. limitations to this, but I was gonna do it. I had to be important. Um, mm. But rather like here, it was a four year course unlike here, but um, the first year you had to do two crafts. And quite frankly, I, I don't think I knew crafts existed if I was gonna to be totally honest. And I certainly hadn't been terribly aware of them, the art college, because they were all in the basement. And I chose stained glass because I had to go to church with my mother occasionally and wild away getting bored looking at the stained glass. And pottery because for no better reason than we ate off ceramics. and. I met the woman who was in charge of the apartment. She was a Tweedy Scottish lady. As I said to Jean, I suspect she had been a redhead, but- uh, Katie so, Horseman. Yeah, Katie Horseman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Katie actually swore at me. I'd never been sworn at by a woman before. This was just never happened in my particular circle of people. And I fell in love with clay. I, I don't really, you know, I, if you ask me honestly, I think it is two things. Um, the environment of the department, it was one of the few places that was really being original and not hide bound by Scottish English traditions and probably the only one in Britain at the time. Um, it had a sort of an international feel. She brought in American teachers who brought in a whole other way of thinking. But I think it was mo mostly two other things, the sheer sensuality of the medium and the fact that the medium was a discipline. You don't walk away from clay. Clay bites you if you do that. And there's practically no other art form which says, uh, -uh you know, you may think you're going to walk away, but you mm. stay right here because I'm going to be ready in 15 minutes. And if I'm ready, tough. Well, I challenge you on that, and I think that printmaking comes very close to it at times when you've leave, left stuff in the bath and you're etching it, and it can be particularly sensitive. But then again, you were also a printmaker, and you did some printmaking, did you not? Oh, yeah. No, I, I had to, when I went to graduate school, we had to do a second subject, so I did printmaking. I was terrible at it. And the teacher who taught it was really kind of indifferent to the teaching the course. He just, he just basically sort of opened the studio and said, go away and do something. So right. I, I did printmaking, but no, it didn't have the same discipline for me. It didn't have the same yeah. 
the and it didn't have the same sensuality. It just yeah. it just didn't work as well. <laughs> So you humorously described, you talked about you were down in the plumbing division of the, the arts and post diploma. So that was, um, did you see us at that time, did you experience a division where the craft or pottery was seen as less than or less important? Oh God, it wasn't even an issue of less important. It was down in the basement. You didn't know it existed. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, there's a, there were, I mean, the, the Krauss movement was developing in Britain. It always had been in one form or another since the, well, I mean, in, in terms of how we knew it since the, uh, the you know, well, William Morris and company and people like that, but really, and then with Bernard Leach, pottery had become sort of slightly respectable for the upper classes to dabble their fingers in and, you know, become sort of slightly important and very pedantic, which I suspect caught on in my case, but um, no, I mean, it just, it didn't exist. You, you consigned yourself to being very unimportant. <laughs> it was quite yeah. simple, you know. But it worked for you. So you found yourself like in love with clay down in the basement and you loved the sensuality of it. You loved the materiality of it. But then there were also, I guess, other influences you talk about, um, like you, you had a wonderful teacher in philosophy who kind of led you to think and you discovered actually you could think. Well, that was graduate school, I, I suppose. Right. I mean, I, I was an extensive reader. I always had been. So I, I mean, when I said teasing, I didn't know I could think. I didn't, I didn't really think anything off it. It was just something one did, you know, and I, I certainly would never have considered looking at what I was doing in a broader sense. But um, yeah, it was one, when I went to graduate school, again, you had to do other courses, grad courses. And there was this wonderful young guy from Harvard. He'd been given his PhD before he'd even completed his presentation and decided he was gonna teach a course on the philosophy and, and theory of art and was horrified when he discovered every single female undergraduate at the institution wanted to take the course because all he wanted to teach it to was some 20, 10 or 15 graduate students because as he explained, he didn't know anything about the subject and he was in no position to teach it. So he wanted to just have a sort of, you know, a sort of platonic sort of discourse in which he sat amongst the pupils and discussed the philosophy and the theory of art. Uh, it didn't work. He got the at least 100 of the undergraduate females who thought he was the cutest thing that ever existed. Uh, I think your, your audio went there yeah. maybe for a moment. Am I still there? I can hear you, know, yeah. I'm still there, am I? Am I still Sorry. We, we need to mute somebody else. There is interference coming through. Sorry, Peter, carry on. Okay. Um, anyhow, he, he, he proceeded to lecture for the next three months. Once a week, he'd get up and do these hour long lectures where some of the most informative lectures I've ever heard, even though as he said, he was just trying, he was running by the seat of his pants and rehearsing them every week. And when it came to writing papers, um, the very first paper I wrote, he refused to mark it, which as you can imagine was rather upsetting. But when I went and asked him, whoops, I'm stood in something and lights flashed all over the place. Um, when I went and asked him why I was, he was refusing to mark it, he said, well, he didn't mark papers which were being written by somebody who he regarded as a peer. What which, a nice compliment. <laughs> it was a, it was an outrageous compliment. <laughs> yeah. But I suddenly began rethinking. And in the meantime, as I said to Jean, um, I was in a department which the person I'd gone to study with had gone away. I was being self, we were self teaching ourselves. It was a group of people who came from universities from all over the States. We were in an institution in which there was a very major ceramic sculpture teaching in another part of this institution. And so just about all of us turned to doing sculpture. Um, and I was doing these huge, big sort of six foot, seven foot high or long things that wriggled across floors and up walls and over ceilings. And one day it just suddenly dawned on me that if the person who was doing the sculptures was the 
same person as was making the functional wear, maybe I'd better rethink where the two things stood in relationship to each other. And it was a major change. It just pointed out that no, just because you made things that worked in people's environments that worked in their lives very subtly, they were no less important. Mm. And I think that that kind of um, the epiphany of that and the realization comes through the making and the doing of the work. I don't think that kind of, you can arrive at that really and, and, and be content with it or understand it if you're not engaged in making or at least attempting to in both of those areas, like the sculptural and also the functional or the everyday object. Well, and, and also, I, I had mentioned this, Jean, this was the time of which conceptual art was beginning to move into the, the marketplace, into the art mm -hmm. field. And I became very aware that although there are many artists who work in that field whose work I hugely admire and accept, it was pretty obvious living in Los Angeles and going to galleries around Los Angeles and stuff that 90% of the work depended almost entirely on the words that surrounded it, that the actual pieces themselves mm. were of little value in themselves. And also raised that very interesting question of, yes, art does not need to be permanent. Ballet isn't permanent. Mm. Um, many forms of performance are not permanent. Mm but we do need permanence or at least continuity in our lives. And so I began questioning just exactly where these things stood and why they stood there. And as Jean and I were saying the other day, that question led on to a further question of, as the art, the act of making art has over the last, well, over the 30 years after the beginning of the seventies began to change radically. Multimedia became the catchword departments in ceramics, in metal, in, in sculpture, in painting, all over North America, all over Europe, began getting trash for multimedia departments where there was no real training in any single one of the media. And Jean and I were talking the other day and were saying, you know, there was a problem with this, which some of us recognize because it has to do with language mm. that when you lose a language, <clears throat> excuse me, be it, be it a, a common language, the use of, of French in French communities, whether it's Mi'kmaq or anything else, you're losing a way of looking at the world. You're using mm. a language which can describe differently and a language which insists that you step aside mm. and treat your world differently. And it is an enormous way just to interrupt there, Peter. It was like it's a, a way of knowing and being and doing. So the culture, not just things that are passed on by ancestors, but the, the whole culture is embodied within that language. So the, the knowledge and the way of thinking even is carried within it. And the whole experience of the landscape. Mm -hmm the whole experience of survival, the whole experience of value, all of those are built into a language. And for most of us in the arts, our language is more often than not our medium. Mm. And whilst I am absolutely in favor of multimedia artworks, and I'm absolutely totally in favor of working with other artists who are experts in their media. And in many ways, that's how Gina and I got together on this kind of stuff, sort of having fun, just yeah. developing ideas for projects where we, we shared our skills. The fact remains is if you can't speak fluently in at least one language, you haven't got to the starting point. You haven't, you're not on the end of the diving board. You're just standing on the side of the water. Mm -hmm. and, and it worries me and it worried me then and it, really affected the way I viewed what subsequently became my teaching practice and everything else that maybe I that's loved. an interesting crossover Peter there a segue in that kind of you know you can map your way into choosing play and choosing the creative life with the influence of great teachers and you were also you responded there was something within you that was guided there 
but then you've crossed over to be a teacher. So you went from graduate school and then you went to teach a job. Was it in uh, Virginia, the University of Virginia? No, I was offered a job. Oh, Jean's talking about this thing. It's one of those things. I was offered a job by a person, uh, a professor who I respected enormously teaching at the University of Virginia. But <laughs> sadly or fortunately, I'm not sure which, the job was actually heading up the graduate school. <laughs> and I just, the two things. I mean, one was I, I, I had the common sense to think this is a little bit laughable. I've just crawled out of graduate school and now I'm going to be asked to head up a graduate department. That's nonsense. And much as I respected the person, I respected and was flattered by his opinion of me, it did seem presumptuous. The other reason was my mother was still in Britain. I felt I should be probably one of the family should be back there in case she needed help. We didn't get on very well together, but <laughs> um, or at least at the time we didn't. But still, it was a it was a responsibility, and also I was still sitting on that problem of how do I resolve this feeling that despite all the sort of Oh, I don't know, wrong words for tradition, for depending on tradition, for building on, on technique, technology, stuff like this. But I still was struggling with that sort of aspect of where did this fit into the art world? And why was the art world discrediting anything that had the name of craft attached to it? Because the argument was just building up in full force by the time, by the late 60s, early 70s, you couldn't read a magazine without finding that crafts was down, yeah. art was up and, yeah. you know, and, and but yet I'd been going through an experience where what's the difference? Same yeah. person, same mind, different context. Mm. And, the and issue it's like we've come full context. circle now, Peter. I think that people realize that now. And, and it's not that, you know, it's a, it's not a new wave of thinking. People like yourselves have, have operated uh, with that philosophy and, and choosing to run their practice that way all along. You talk about like this idea of uh, sharing questions and sharing questions brings us together, like everything from like art, religion, fellowship, kinship, power, money, like those things are seen as separations and segregations. And sometimes it's not so much that we have all the answers, but that we can share questions together. Just where you want to go with this one. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to well, talk I mean, for a second and I have to go plug my power cable in. Oh, good. I'm relieved. I just thought it was that thing that happened at the, um, at the uh, conference the other day when somebody had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> do I keep talking while she disappears? <laughs> the, one of the things about cra the craft experience, I think, was that that was the other aspect I discovered more so than the fine arts or anywhere else, an incredible sense of fellowship. When I moved into the fine arts community, I found competition. I found competition to get into galleries, competition to be recognized, competition to have one's name, name made important, a lack of desire to share more often than not. Whereas in the crafts community, I found that there was a huge desire to share. People would be practically hauling students and friends into their galleries. They would be giving them all their trade secrets. The argument was simply, no, if you're willing to learn, I can give you anything I know. It's your job to build in it and build with it. You'll never finish up being the same as me because we do not share a common background and experience. And that is part of our art work. But nonetheless, for that very reason, we can afford to share and expand and work together and it wasn't present in the fine art community in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s and even to some extent today when I look at my friends who are in the fine arts there is not that sense of oh come on let's do this together you know we do, I don't need to keep my reputation separate from yours. Mm. Uh, you, you mentioned something else there and I'm just trying to remember what it was though. Um, 
any of go back to ask a question, Jean. I've, I've forgotten what. Sure. The other okay, not a problem. So um, I was thinking, you know, when, when you talk about like the craft versus art, etc., and you mentioned like in Western philosophers, um, they've always gone on the assumption that a uh, fact is something that's cut and dry and precise and immobile and unyielding in ways. But, but then you look at the, the kind of the Chinese philosophers and they deny this. Um, so you mentioned that like a fact is something crawling and alive, like a little furry and cool to the touch that crawls down the back of your neck. Um, that was Lin Yutang. There you and go. And it was actually Lin Yutang who made, who made the, the comment about that in the West that we see things as facts, things that can be analyzed and discussed. And, that um, to, to an Easterner, ideas and thought and facts are something cool and furry that crawls up the back of your neck. Yeah. But this again, you know, I, I, I don't really want to get into it because I mentioned to Gene that, you know, when I moved over to California, this was California of the 60s, this was hippiedom at its highest. It was cuddly, feely, touchy, do anything, you know, sort of nude parties in every beach if you could possibly do it and drink a lot of hallucinogenic drugs if you could, could get that too. Um, but it was all sort of kind of half-assed, e even the height Ashbury revolution, shoving flowers and things. If you were an outsider, which I always been because of my upbringing, it was quite obvious that, okay, first of all, Hippiedom was designed for men. It wasn't designed for women. And men just found a better way of persuading women to be, to some extent, submissive. And only a few managed to fight that. And I found this extremely demeaning. And, you know, free love was really free love for men. You know, yeah. And we enjoy it. And so you ought to. Um, there was that. But there was also this other pervasive thing within a lot of the arts and a lot of the, mostly in crafts. But... You know, Zen. Zen was a wonderful thing, and to the certainly to the ceramic industry, it came in all kinds of forms. Um, Shibui and um, uh, you know, sort of uh, all these wonderful worlds for words for touchy feely sort of you know slightly vague thoughts about what art was. And, and you know, it's really embarrassing when I look back at some of the books published in the seventies in my particular profession, ceramics. We were the sneak up on the pot and hit it with a two by four school of potters. You know, you, you reckon if you whopped a pot when it wasn't looking, this was exciting and it was dramatic and it was zen and it was wonderful. And this is a load of bullshit. I mean, later on we began to realize that the Japanese potters who did work like that actually spent years and years studying, but not in the way we study. There was something about all these associations with with Zen, it had to do with not sitting down and using words to analyze something. It had to do with accepting that there is a huge part of the human experience, which is always has been and always will be totally nonverbal. We can use words around it, but the experience, whether it's of religion, whether it's of love, whether it's of a summer morning, it doesn't matter. There are no words for it. And there's an acceptance in the Japanese aesthetic and, and the Chinese aesthetic that no, these things are present, but the only way you can learn them is to sit beside them, submit to them, be quiet, listen, watch, and finally work out some kind of point at which these things move together, the ability of humans to make something and the acceptance that nature, that the environment, that the world, that physics can now modify this. And somewhere in between that balance, there's a harmony. I was sort of laughing at Gene. I said, I have a theory and it is totally unbased on any factual theory you can come up with, yeah. which is, we're all made out of molecules. Molecules obey structural physical laws and all the parts of them. So it would not be surprising if as you work your way up through the system, all systems are governed by their basic structure. That a lot of what we view as aesthetics, a lot of what we view as harmony, as peace, as 
being okay in the moment mm. are things which are built out of a comfort with mm. with sort of accepting that those physical laws are in balance mm. and that they don't necessarily demand words and mm. this is one of the reasons why i feel that the domestic crafts the things that people view as functional handcrafts which are anything but they work from a long tradition of looking at those harmonies looking at those things which bring peace looking at those things which make people feel comfortable at one with the moment and the only way to sneak those things into a contemporary life is practically through your kitchen sink or on your back or on your ears because you don't think about them, but they're with you all day long and they're working on you. And that is something, and it, it, is not a, it is not a value of a judgment. It is something the other arts don't often get to do. You know, mm. the painting, all of us can be used as status symbols, mm. but we walk past the painting on our wall. We sit with the mug in our hand for hours. Mm. And that was another side of that balance for me that, justified being a potter, not a major artist, not anything else, that there's this subversive part to the whole business. Mm. So did you find that's why um, it eventually, or one of the reasons too that led you to clay was that it, it kind of produced that space where you could be of service. It embraced the design that was even, if it was invisible, was still there. Um, and also allowed for, like there was no noise, there was that, um, it had a demonstrated effort of, of what you were trying to do to make something functional and good in the world. I, I, think, I think you might say it was the one bit of being in the arts that sort of, in some ways, dealt with my sort of Fabian socialist background, right. you know, it was yeah. a service. Um, but it, it took a long time to actually reason that out. It was, it was an accept, you know, an acceptance that no, it was more than a service. You know, it, it, it also gets back to that whole lovely idea of, and that's probably a conversation we don't have time for now, but crafts is, a, you know, when you, when you go and look at the meaning of the word craft, which in fact, by the way, sat right beside art, they were never separated to the Renaissance. But it was a really very interesting word, as was art. They implied power, skill, magic, but they also implied subversiveness, tricksters, and it's not an accident that so often in mythology you find the craftspeople mm. are associated with, you know, Loki or Raven or leprechauns or the shapeshifter um, the fit for shapeshifters the shapeshifter you know? yeah yeah they were always there and it was a very interesting role because at one level they were the magicians of the community but they weren't to be trusted mm. at another level and this is you know another discussion gene and i've had they were entirely at the service of their community they could not exist without a community, but the community needed them to identify what their community was, what the status of their community was, what, how to take pleasure in, 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 in rituals by having things which made that ritual function and process properly. Um, they were all these things. So it was this interesting balance between the artist as a servant of community and an artist as a person who would very subtly drive the community. This is shift in contemporary arts. We see ourselves in some strange way as being totally independent leaders. And, you know, you have to buy me because I'm important. But on the other hand, I can bloody well do what I want, even if you don't want to buy me. Mm -hmm. um, but you still have to support me. It's, it's a very interesting sort of argument that has sunk is snuck into contemporary art practice. Mm. But at the same time, we were always the manipulators. We were always the people who played with people's ideas, which gave people that identity. And it was funny, I was telling Jean that my doctor these days, you, you, you're on the phone to your doctor. We, he picked up the phone, actually talked to my partner, but got launched in me on the role of art and community. And the fact, 
And he said it, but it was interesting. I just finished writing it. Try and think what a community is without art. Mm. It doesn't exist. You can't it's identify true. it. Yeah. It's not there. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of, uh, and I had read some philosophy recently and some psychology and looking at this idea of the how we fit, how we fit even within our own personal narratives and stories. But really, I was looking for answers to where artists fit within communities. And I came across a really interesting guy called Sadakis. And he wrote extensively on looking at what he calls the three selves. And for me, it made so much sense because it applied to our practice and, and to, to craftspeople and to anybody I know who functions this way with the kind of consideration and understanding that they themselves are part of a community. Anyway, he talks about how the, as an artist and as people, we have the private self, like the individual self, but then there's the relational self, like how we relate to others. And we have these one-to-one these -one conversations or, or friendships or relationships, but then there's the communal self. And all three of these selves fit within the one person. And in, in reflecting upon this, I could see just how, for me, how, how vitally important the community is and how we are in relation with each other and how even the small gestures and the works that I've made in my practice, even when it's just an individual painting, have connected and impacted and how we're beholding to one another. But in particular, community-based work and community projects, there's nothing for me more enjoyable than being out working with groups of people and, and having that dynamic energy and movement and creation happening where I'm a facilitator as opposed to, oh, there's the big artist, right? I'm less interested in that, but it's like, how can you empower them and what can they do with it? Well, it, it comes along, you know, it's, it's that old story about the tree in the forest, you know, at one level, communities can't exist unless they are identified in their artworks, whether it's architecture, whether it's clothing, whether it's the, the, their jewelry, whether it's the pot they drink out of, it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, whether it's the, the sculptures and the walls of the temple. But at the same time, it is arguable that the artist doesn't exist without, the commu without a community. I mean, it doesn't matter what my reputation is. The only value of the, that, that a mug I might make if I'm not making sculpture is in somebody's hand, mm. you know, it doesn't exist otherwise. It is of no value. It isn't doing anything. It's, mm. it's just simply a piece of rock that was ground up into mud and was turned into rock again. It has no, it has no existence yeah. without it being in a hand. And I think that is one of the things that, you know, we are struggling with throughout the 20th century and the 21st century is this sense of what is identity? Where does identity exist? What does identity exist in? I mean, we befriend people by the 3000 on our cell phone, or we friend, friend people, sorry, rather. We can only befriend about 20 people, you know, or there's, I forget what the figure is exactly, but, and then that comes down to the fact then how do you identify what is worthwhile when your work becomes worthwhile, what your work is for, what is the compromise about making work if work only exists, if it is a, is, is a shared entity. Mm -hmm. um, that demands a willingness to compromise. And of course, the arts always had that. It's this 20th century, uh, you know, sort of, well, sort of, self-centeredness that has led us into a lot of problems about deciding exactly why we're doing things what exists as a good life mm. at what level do i feel i'm worthwhile that's right you yeah know? to find the meaning and to yeah. find the value and i think much of that leads back well well we are not our work i know as an artist i derive much of my own life's meaning and my meaning making from my artistic process, from engaging in creation, from being in the studio, from being, for being within an arts community. And so um, it is contextual. I realize that part of me gaining my value and meaning that I need for, to, 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 to feel like I'm living a fulfilled life comes from being situated next to people who are also creative. 
but it, it, it also leads to that question, you know, of valuation. Mm -hmm. um, is, is it sufficient to be valued by a few friends to be living a good life? Or do I have to have another $100,000 um, mm -hmm. to be identified as having a good life? Is in fact my life better living quietly engaged time where I hardly talk to anybody, by the way, which people may find very strange, but, um, and where I, where I live a slightly schizophrenic life, because Jean just got on that other awkward part of both, what is an art career. For most of us, it's actually split. There is the act of making, which is a contemplative, it is a, it is an internal, it is a rhythm of being within oneself, although it may evidence itself in outside things, paintings, pots, whatever. Mm. But then there is that other self, which is how do I stand outside in that community I talk to, the students I work with, um, what is important? And there is a certain degree of schizophrenia there, which I haven't actually ever quite come to terms with, you know, which is the real person. Mm. Um, and maybe that isn't an answer. The real person is the person between. Mm. And, and to the degree which both parts of their lives are being satisfied, that of providing something of value to their community, whether it's friendship, whether it's you need $10, here's $10 because you're sitting beside the road, um, or whether it's that rhythm. I mean, for many potters, production potters, the only way to come to terms with getting life on a pattern is to sit down and throw 40 or 50 mugs at the same time and treat it rather the way that a, a Buddhist monk would feel um, chanting. You know, it's that same way of centering yourself. I, I find that word worrying, but for lack of a better one. Um, so, you know, we're, also, we're always going to be condemned to a slightly schizophrenic life and we're just about to wander totally off subject. <laughs> no, well, you know, it, it's complex, right? It's never just one thing or the other. And I think that we've talked about a lot of like dualities and divisions and separations. And you've talked about the term art and craft. And I, I think that that discussion of also artist or creator and teacher can pose the same kind of sometimes it feels schizophrenic. Um, but I think I think for me, I've come to understand that it will always feel that way. I, I, I'm less interested now in labeling where I fit in either of those things. I can't seem to um, fully get to grasps with it. So I'm just kind of just do it, just do it and see where it takes me. I'm, th I'm thinking actually of, of uh, you've used the term um, tactile arts, which I don't think has come up yet, but that's, that's a term that you use to um, often describe your work and also you feel has more authenticity in it maybe. Would I be right in saying that to, to honor the process? It's sort of a, I mean, it's the, the word has always been round off and on. Um, the Renaissance was a bit of a disaster in some ways, because up till the Renaissance, you would never have divided craftspeople, artists, or anything else. People were makers, mm. and people made things within the community for the community, but often created an image of the community for the community and themselves. The Renaissance began that evolution of the artist is somebody important who commands high prices, who does something original, who is recognized because they are the ones who've done something different from the others. To the extent that by the 21st century, it didn't really matter how good the different was, as long as it was different, you honored them hugely. Or if they only did two or three different things, but kept repeating it, it was too late. They were already different and terribly important. Um, on the other side of the fence, you got the craftsperson. Well, the craftsperson made things for a start, which because they were domestic, were highly unlikely to acquire the same price as a very large sculpture. A mug just simply isn't a very large sculpture. I mean, for me, it's contextual. I don't want a sculpture on my dinner table and I don't want to leave my mug out in the middle of the field. But it, began to be used as a pejorative, that that's craft, 
that's fine art or art. And I think the big and final sort of schism came by the 60s when I'm much older than most of you, but when I started, all our colleges were colleges. They were not universities. If you went to a university, you could study art history. I could not get a PhD in 1967 unless I studied art history. Mm. And MFA was the highest degree I could possibly yeah, get. A term that was degree, the equivalent yeah. of a PhD in the arts. Mm. Um, but then they moved into university and became degree granting. Initially, you found that artists who moved into university fought for the right of actually exhibition rather than publish. And that worked for a while. They could move in there and as long as they had an exhibition once every two years, it was considered the same as publishing papers. Mm -hmm. And that was okay, you were acceptable as a university professor. But very quickly it began moving into, yes, but you have to back this up. And off we went into using words to define what art was and wasn't. And the whole idea of art as a evaluative thing for people to create their self-worth, you know, and a sheik in Arabia is going to buy a, a, a pre-Raphaelite painting or, or, a, or a Monet, it doesn't matter, but that makes them important. Nobody else will ever get to see it, but now this, they're important because they can afford to have one of these things. When I look at the magazines in my field running from the 70s and 60s, they are still carrying on this argument about art and craft. Well, as I said earlier, for me, it's simply contextual. I, I don't mm. give a damn mm. what they work on you in different ways. They work on different ways of your senses and they are totally contextual. You know, Jean's scarf that she's wearing is a scarf that she li likes to wear because it identifies her. Mm. It gives her a feeling of being at one with herself. This is me. This is it. That's all it needs to do. It's not important or unimportant. In fact, one of the Japanese the criteria is this idea of shibui, which amongst other explanations, it is of no importance. It cannot be evaluated because it's just this. You yeah. can't give the value. If it's not here, it's not here. If it is here, it is here. Um, and I finally, got, Sorry, I, was, I finally got more and more frustrated with this art craft discussion. And although I put no value on it, it wasn't really getting me anywhere when I was talking to people. So it was simple to turn around and say, okay, we have the fine arts, we have the tactile arts, we have the whatever you want, mm -hmm. I don't care. Yeah. Um, but the tactile arts sort of covered a whole area of stuff. And just like all the other arts, you could say, technically, this is a bad piece of art. Mm -hmm. um, theoretically, philosophically, emotionally, whatever other word you want to discuss, it is a good or a bad piece of art but this is a tactile piece of art. This is a fine art painting. This is a piece of sculpture. We will judge them according to how they're made and yeah. what values the artist says this should be judged by. Yeah, going back to what you mentioned in terms of the context, so that the contextualizing that even as well. Um, so when we, when we leave behind the dark glass of language and the problem of, of the labeling of, uh, and, the, and the use of language even by others to describe where we fit within our context, whether it's craft or art. Um, I want to return back to this idea of um, the, the meaning making and the structure. Um, you talked about, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I do remember w when you mentioned about serving others, that that was like one motivation. And another one would be that you kind of saw or would like for your work um, to, be, to stand well against your peers' work. And that was another form of meaning. And then the third one um, you mentioned, uh, and we've talked about before, was this notion of hope. OK, first of all, <laughs> you misquote me slightly. I didn't say I wanted my work to stand amongst my peers. So we'll go back to the whole, I'll go back to the whole first. Okay. Would All you of us as artists go through per periods regularly. Good God, I keep standing on something here. Lights keep changing. Um, keep All of us go through this, these, what Winston Churchill described as the black dog days. Mm. Um, we all go through self-doubt. We all wonder. I mean, 
I doubt I get through a month before I don't I what I'm up to suspiciously and think there are another hundred other fucking ceramics out there who are doing some beautiful work and why the hell am I doing this because it's they're there you know I, they, they don't need me it's pointless mm. um and also you know Jean and I discussed I, I have a, a continuing struggle with my work because of the nature of how I've chosen to live my life I have never embarked in a body of work which has given me the continuity that would not only develop the quality and the focus that I think work needs, but also would give me the recognition. And, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm not, whether out of, I don't want to be concerned with it because then I would have to judge myself or I don't want to be concerned with it because that's simply irrelevant. It's the way I've chosen to work. I'm, but, and this is, you still have to work. And I think there's few things that can keep us alive. There's few things that can keep us functioning beyond hope. I mean, that's the one word in the human lexicon, which actually has meaning. It doesn't matter whether your hope is in religion, of another world, of a better life, of, or just that you can make things more livable for the moment. Mm. But also in that hope, you have to feel that, and I could contribute, uh, contribute to this, which goes back to the quote Jean said, when I'm really desperate, although I'm awful at recording my work, I will go back and look at pieces I made 10 or 15 years ago and remember that some friends of mine were being supportive of me at the time, but look at them and think, oh, you know, I, I really sort of abandoned these, I put them down, I'd left them behind. And at the time, I wasn't really sure where they were going or where they could go or what they were about, but actually, if I look at some of those pieces, and as I say, my work is very, it, it doesn't have the integrity of a continual level of practice. I can look back and say, no, no, that stood up amongst my peers and was, I can look at what my peers were doing at the time and I can look at that was and that, okay, that was standing up amongst them. So if it stood amongst them then, the probability is what I'm doing now is doing the same thing because I'm suffering exactly the same doubts mm, mm. and i and i think the same applies to you know one's teaching um i don't i get up every morning and sort of suspiciously look at myself and really question what the hell i'm doing because i'm sure yeah. somebody else could do it just as well yeah. um but then i'm hungry so getting a few <laughs> dollars out of the government isn't a bad thing um, but no, I wouldn't, I would stop if I look back sort of a year or two back and there was no way in which I could say this had actually functioned in any way amongst those to, with, with whom I was working amongst my students. And but, but I don't, you I don't have expect seen people to love me or like me, but I do expect to occasionally think, no, somebody said, thank you. So those those moments of hope that were visible and that's what gets you going again when you look back and there is that recognition. I think it's important for our students to know too that we all feel this way and certainly I question my practice, I question my work, past stuff that I've done and I do question not every day but there's moments regularly when I have to question my teaching and what am I doing here? Do I want to stay here? And what value am I really bringing? Like, is this important right now? And I think that kind of level of self-reflection and self-questioning is a very difficult thing to do. And I think it's a very healthy thing to do. It helps sharpen the saw, keeps us on our toes. Um, I'm conscious, Peter, that we have three minutes left. I'm so really... We're well, you're really, I could talk my way out of this. <laughs> well, the thing is, I really enjoyed it. I could listen to you for hours and hours and we could talk here. I'm, I'm thinking at this moment that we should pause and also um, ask, would anybody like to uh, make a comment or a question? So Anita says, um, how do you recommend someone get involved in the craft art community in Fredericton? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, if you're at the college, involved in the college, you're doing it. You know, talk to your friends. That is your network, not the one that's on your Facebook. Uh, when I first arrived in the province, it was very easy. The New Brunswick Crafts Council 
you knew every single damn craftsperson on the council. We met three or four times a year, usually at somebody's workplace, and we'll have a great party, get somewhat drunk, make a few decisions about the craft council and go home. But those carried over. We talked to each other endlessly. I think being willing to create, it, it's really difficult. And I think it's so much we've begun to rely on our technological ability to make contact rather than the sheer effort of saying, invite six fellow craftspeople over and have a party, Yeah, you know? Um, but that's where you get supported. It's when you're sitting with that group of people doing what Gene and I will do, which is arguing, slagging each other, stating <laughs> things that we don't even believe in, being outrageous, just to see what, just to see what will come out of the situation and exactly. hoping nobody outside of the group hears you because it'll be considered politically incorrect and you weren't going that way. Anyhow, you were trying yeah. to look for yeah. new resolutions, new ways of looking at things just by being challenging. But also being supportive. Um, yeah, you know, it's like I, I, finding those safe spaces and trusting them and finding people as, as spaces to try those things with and try and to try it, yeah. And do it when you're young, it, you know, I mean, God help me, I look at, I've got a <laughs> bunch of people who I really adore, who I think about on a daily basis, a few of them are now dead, um, but who I haven't really sat down with for years, I mean, you know, mm. amazing people like Peter Pounding, but even my friend Flo Gregg was just a hundred yards down the road. Mm. We do usually manage to have supper once a year, mm. you know? Yeah. We used to do this regularly years ago. Yeah. So do it while you're young, because if you don't, you get really lousy as you get older. You just get more and more comfortable just going into your little workspace, doing your work and pretending that you can get on with the world and just mm. have your own pattern. Avoid that, get outside of your pattern when you're young and meet people. I love it. And you know, maybe that's a good point to end on Peter because it's almost time. And so to say, to remind us all to reach out to each other more and to realize that we belong and to expand ourselves beyond where we're at. And um, there've been some nice comments have come through. Lee McLean has said, how did we end up with his skills and perspective at MVCCD? <laughs> yeah, we, we think you're awesome, Peter. We feel very lucky and privileged to have you here. Mary Stewart from Florida has said she's it's wonderful dialogue and the format and the conversation. And uh, she would love to get a reading list from uh, uh, Jean or Peter or both. And she loved the comment. Um, Audrey said that it's been great. Thank you, Peter. Um, Matt. Cripps has joined us and is listening in and Marilyn Luscombe too and they've uh, thanked you. Thank um, you. I've missed one comment there and I want to honor it because I've read all the others. So it says, Mary says, um, I loved a comment by a wonderful teacher I met in the critique, some with your hands open, not, sorry, some with your hands open, not your fists closed. Lively dialogue and substantial critique, both forms of support. I'll just say one thing there. I, I tried oh, too quickly. Uh, it really was come with your hands open in a critique, not with your fists closed. Yeah. Don't stand there trying to fight for your project. Instead, be willing to offer your best insights and to accept whatever anybody else has to offer. Yeah. Well Wonderful. Thank you for that golden nugget to end our talk. Um, and thank, thank you, Peter. We love you. We're very fond of you. And Alison, I'm going to pass it back to you. Um, let me see. So you probably just want to know who's coming next week, Ali? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Peter, um, and all of the everyone who attended. Next week on December 10th is going to be Jackie Burke. So we hope to see you guys then. Wonderful. Join us then. Until next week. Over and out. Peace. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. You're welcome, Jean.